Steampunk is an anachronistic genre. In recent times, an old story has become popular again. A story about a tournament that took place in an abandoned steampunk city, and the animated stone statue that almost got it all. A story about how he encountered a wide range of people, from merfolk to vampires, and how he lies, cheats, and destroys anyone he encounters, all in pursuit of his hatred of all mankind, and how this blind hatred ultimately did him in. However, to see the events of Tidelay through only his perspective is to not receive the whole picture. There was a whole tournament full of people after all, and they all have their own stories to tell. Not just the ones encountered by the stone statue, but everyone who was involved. Not everyone's story has survived to the modern day, but by the end, enough records will be collated so that a clearer picture can be made about. The Law of Talos. In a not too far off land, there exists a city known as Tidelay. Long before, back in the time of steam powered engines, it was the epicenter of the most cutting edge technology in the world. Intelligent autonomy were created, flying vehicles soared through the skies. Things were created that far surpassed the technological limits of its time. And however, it became apparent that the city was also under a curse. A mysterious effect known as the Law of Talos, where technology powered by sources other than steam were unable to function. The cause of this phenomenon was unknown, but over time its effect was pronounced. With its technology level locked, the entire world passed it by in advancements, and its leading minds fled elsewhere. Centuries later, and the city is a ghost town. The city streets, already winding and labyrinth-like in its Victorian architecture, were slowly crumbling and the steam vents that line the streets rhythmically hiss and puff for a dwindling population. Long abandoned automatons roam the streets, while scroungers look through the rubble for scrap parts. While there is a population in the thousands, the land was meant to house far more, now unused. Many stay due to lack of alternatives, but some stay of their own reasons, like one old man who lived in the city since he was born. After a lifetime of experimentation, he had completed his life's work, a wishing machine. After using the machine to restore his hair, the machine had only one more wish to grant, but instead of using it on himself, he decided to let someone else have it. On the suggestion of the old man's nephew, he decided to form a tournament to determine the wishing machine's recipient. The motive for this form of decision was twofold making a spectacle for outsiders to become interested in the old city again, and also to make ingenuity a deciding factor in the winner. To encourage the later, contestants were given machine parts upon entrance to the competition, with the expectation that they would use them to create gadgets to assist them, though they weren't necessary to compete. They were required to surrender their parts and anything they made with them to their opponent upon losing, so that they can further innovate upon what they've made. After getting the infrastructure for the tournament in place, the two relatives sent word across the globe and indeed, competitors who desired a wish arrived. The group most interested in this tournament were, naturally, inventors and mechanics. One such person was Lucia Albatross, a repair woman from a small town overseas. She is seeming content with her life and work, though there is one thing she does desire, to know why she has never heard back from her boyfriend who left abroad to work on Zeppelins and hadn't been heard back since. Upon receiving the invitation through Pigeon Mail, she decides to take a chance on the tournament, riding there on her vehicle, the Fishbot, designed for flight and submerged travel. She wasn't the only one taking a chance on the tournament. Keith was a man who tried to open his own business, along with his sister, Monique, selling inventions of their own design. Despite his determinations, he was having problems. Not only was he lacking funding to launch his business, but Monique was employed to the Azraroth Incorporation and was unable to split her efforts. To combat this, 
Keith got the assistance of the 10-year-old prodigy claiming to be Eli Labriola. Labriola is supposed to be a 45-year-old genius in robotics, and while the person now working with Keith is 10 in both appearance and attitude, his intelligence remains able to create the robotic butler Antonius all on his own. Despite this, his business continued to underperform until Monique found an opportunity for him. Azraroth received an invitation of their own, but declined as they would make better and more probable profit by filming the event and supplying guard bots. Monique gave the invitation to Keith and Eli to attempt the main event on their own, which they accepted. It wasn't just lonely startup inventors whom the invitations were given out. The Tinley man had many peers, like Thaddeus Pockets, a brilliant watchmaker who leads the world market in watches, able to keep time endlessly without winding. However, he could not attend, for he was ill and expected to die soon. So he passed the invitation to his grandson, Eric Pockets. Like his family, he was a prodigy in tinkering, but he had ambitions to branch his family's company out into the fields of war machines. Still, he honored his grandfather's desire to participate in Tidley's tournament, even though he wasn't fully prepared for the city's effect on technology. The Pockets weren't the only major family who took a chance with this tournament. There were also the Frolics. Based in Germany, they were a mecha manufacturer with a prodigy of the family, Steffi Frolic, personally interested in mech fighting, especially in her custom-made machine, the KiwiBot. After a subpar performance in the Steel Nation mech tournament, she decided to take her shot in Tidely, bringing with her a redesigned KiwiBot made to operate within the law of Talos. Dropping down from over the city, she is prepared for anything, except for the fact that her prosthetic leg cannot function within the city. Some contestants traveled a lot further than other countries. Jinam Vinali was a janitor for the Planetary Intergalactic Space Spectacle, the PISS. A timid person, already rattled when her boyfriend passed away three weeks prior, she was not in the best headspace to perform her duties, which led to the part of the ship she was maintaining to malfunction. She was among the first led into the evacuation shuttles, but instead of landing in her home city of Casimir, she landed in Tidalay. In further misfortune, she was mistaken as a competitor and was given a kit and further instructions on how to compete. With little recourse, she reluctantly steps forward towards the action. While most contestants traveled from far away to attend, some were Titanian residents. Before the tournament was set up, Angus, the old inventor, and his nephew Jordan were pitching the idea to his friend Clarence, and during the meeting, a lone chimbley sweeper child happened to be doing his work in the residence. When he overheard their plan to start a tournament, he bursts into the conversation, pointing out that bringing fighters into the city is far more likely to harm it than make it grow. The child is aware of this, as a year before he was unwillingly entered into a different tournament involving fairy tale characters in an insane asylum, all of which crumbled to the ground by the event's end. His concerns are ignored. The inventor contacted Clarence because he is the leader of Title A's chapter of the Freemason Society and requires their help to set the tournament up, which he agrees to. As the kid keeps pushing back against the idea, Clarence proposes to the child he enters the tournament himself in order to wish for the event to retroactively never happen. He is extremely displeased about the prospect of being torn apart by tournament maniacs, but seeing as the possibility looms over his head regardless, he is given no choice. He wasn't the only Title A resident forgotten by the city. On the eve of the event, a steam automaton emerged from a mountain of scrap parts in the junkyard outside the city. The android was spontaneously brought to life, where it immediately became enamored with a fork. Nearby, an intended contestant of the tournament noticed the machine committing acts of boobery and decides to attack it and take its parts for himself. When his attack failed to leave a dent, he tried to pass the attack off as how one says hello in the city, only for the machine to say hello back. When a tournament supervisor noticed the event, he unwittingly christened the robot Murphy after Murphy's Law, and decides to trick him into being the replacement contestant, instructing him to say hello to any contestant he meets. Many contestants involve machines through practice or how they're constructed but one was cursed with the association. Kato Kuromizu was the only child of a humble family, but things changed when she received the curse of blood. Whenever she bleeds, the blood transforms into various machine parts that rust away after five minutes. There is only one known way for her to remove the curse, finding her true love. 
Regardless of the curse, she is determined to find her true love and gain a purpose in life. And chances are, even if she doesn't get the wish, getting what she wants isn't out of the realm of possibility. So eager she was to get what she wants, she participated in a fight before the tournament began. Defeating a mechanic named Ryota who tried to force himself into the tournament, thwarted by Kato. And she failed to find him interesting. Despite the invention-centric premise of the event, inventors were a minority of the participants. For that matter, not everyone was bound by hard science. There exists a group known as the Relics Lock-On, a group of treasure hunters looking for ancient artifacts, for profit or for their own affairs. When this group received their invitation, a squad of four, plus 30 small genie-like entities called Taruba, they were sent out so that they can get artifacts that the city might have. Their plan was to send Dembe, their top treasure hunter, and Yi Quan, an amnesiac mage who's forgotten her higher level spells. When squad leader Xuan, concerned for Quan's vulnerable state, decided to replace her with himself though, Dembe distracted them with the illusion that all the Taruba were hanged and escaped the airship with Quan. While falling, he announces to her that his true intention for obtaining the wish, to take over the world with her by his side. Other arcane users were far more humble. Mika was the product of a forbidden romance between two families, the Von Von Krell and the De La Solariasia families, with his mother on the Von Von Krell side exiled. Mika put his craft into fencing, to which he was given a scholarship at Goetia University. There, he met the last two Von Von Krell members who were still willing to reach out for him, his uncle Grimbold and his cousin Rami. Rami was a prodigy in high magic, and was the youngest to attend the university at the age of 12. He also has the record for the most damage to the university in a single experiment. Along with Tycho, the homunculus Rami created, the three of them together took a chance on competing in the tournament, Grimble's instructing Mika to watch out for Rami and his crazy stunts. The contest had numerous prodigy contestants. Born in Hong Kong and raised in suburban America, Lilith came from a line of doctors that used their wealth to give her every piece of education money could buy so that she would continue their family business. But instead of saving the dying, Lilith instead became interested in raising the dead. Creating a research layer in her inattentive parents' basement, she performed experiments until she found the best medium to house souls. Dolls. Her hoard of stuffed toys that her parents would give her as gifts regardless of her disinterest in plushes. Using this, she created a horde of undead souls using dolls as their vessels, including her magnum opus, the Clockwork Bunny, a metallic rabbit able to grow and adapt his body by consuming metal parts. At some point in her growth as a necromancer, she had an encounter with a girl named Re Wicker, a girl about her age that housed innumerable demons inside her body. And while the exact events of this encounter have not yet been recorded, by the end, Lilith grew to despise Ree and vowed to destroy her. It's speculated that a method of crushing Ree is what Lilith wishes for. And so, with the help of an unknown transdimensional entity, he arrives in Tidaling, making quick work of an ambush murderer wanting to compete, and adds his soul to her army of puppets. While some entrants use supernatural powers by choice, Others are supernatural by their very nature. From a higher plane of reality comes a trio of nameless beings knocked down to earth in an unrelated battle. One is a mute child known as the Brave, able to deride power from starlight, including the sun. The steed is a timid sheep helping the Brave as a mount. The sword is a talkative weapon who can consume objects and gain its properties. Not much is known about them, but they are proof that anything is possible in this city. They are not the only ones of mysterious origins. Mizuno is an amphibious humanoid of forgotten origins. His memory of his past are lost, save for being trapped in a tube. There is a voice in his head that tries to berate him into taking less risky routes, though whether it belongs to him or something else is also unknown. Stowing away on a train, he enters the city against the advice of the voice, hoping that the wish will clear his path. Not all that is inhuman wishes to be apart from humanity. One pair of contestants consists of a dragonkin and a human. Todd is a man of military background, yet is ironically very gentle. Aisha is a dragon, one of the last of her kind. Assisting the pair is Todd's younger sister, Jamie, constructing new parts for him by combining the tournament kits with salvaged dragon parts, as well as using her Atlas drones to scout for the pair. With the two of them devoted to each other, 
and with respective wishes that they want for each other, they set off, ready to face whatever they come across, together. Other non-humans are much more set on the path of darkness. On the night of the tournament's beginning, an organizer waits around for a contestant to drop off the steam engine supplies to, and is met face to face with a genuine vampire. Going by the name Relic, the vampire grabs the necessary parts, then leaves. While planning his first moves, his steampunk cell phone starts ringing, and he gets a call from the most unexpected person, Del Barovic, the real-life creator of the character. She reveals that she's the one sending Relic on the quest for the wish, as she desires all of her artist's work to be completed. Relic, for his part, only follows along reluctantly, as despite having the powers of strength, shape-shifting, and vampirism, the idea of crossing her scares him. Relic may be a powerful vampire, but at least he's not also a werewolf. In the distant land of Erratica, Rubicant Enterprises becomes interested in the wishing machine. What they want with the machine is unclear, but to get their prize, they hire the two most fearsome mercenaries unalive, Greg and Renfield, a notorious pair of vamp wolves. Greg is a large vamp wolf with high regenerative properties and expertise in explosives. The bombs on his person have limited sentience and are known to chatter incessantly. Renfield is the smaller, mute vamp wolf who wields a giant pocket knife with a seemingly endless amount of tools within it. With their mission clear, the two of them set out for titling, in search of their client's wish, as well as blood, to carbonate for their own tastes. But not everything monstrous is made of blood. In a remote location, there exists an abandoned amusement park, where due to the power of its centerpiece castle, all of the humanoid statues and figures have been brought to life, living day-to-day -day life isolated from humanity. Most are weary of humans who enter the park, but there is one who outright despises them, and will kill them if given the chance. Who dares to interrupt the song to number 1 in G minor? Carl is a statue from the pirate-themed section of the park, and due to his tendencies towards violence, he is feared as any human, alongside his shape-shifting crow, Arma. When an invitation winds up in the park by chance, Carl takes this as an opportunity, after intimidating Jack, a statue from the haunted house, into giving him a means of transport. He flies to Tidling and encounters the Wish Machine's inventor, who personally gives him the equipment he needs, which he immediately discards. Carl sets off, intending that, even if the Wishing Machine wasn't real, then he'll make Tidling a ghost town, one way or the other. There are other contestants who aren't technological, nor magical, nor supernatural. They are normal people, using the tools at hand to compete. There is a city not far away from Tidally, and polar opposite to Tidally's former technological boom, the industrial age passed by the city entirely, and without a growth industry, it created a city of poverty, a local criminal underground, and a superstitious mistrust of machines. This is the environment Kit Bates grew up in, one of the most notorious enforcers in this underground. She especially hates machines, and when she receives a mission from her boss, a man known as the Cat, to destroy the wishing machine for fear of what it'll do, she takes the job gladly. There are criminals more down on their luck than her. Joshua Bell is an Alabama man with a criminal record and a drug addiction. He had a wife and daughter, but she left him when his queer relationships came to life, refusing to let him see his daughter again. With few financial options, he became a prostitute for a while, but at some point, he contracted the AIDS virus. Now, with his health in decline and time running out, he sees the wishing machine as the only means of survival, despite not fully believing in its existence. Despite having no abilities or even skills, he doesn't have any other option now. He arrives in the city through the sewer system in a haze, packing a gun he stole from his dealer and having severe doubts that his determination will hold out. Other criminals are far more professional and prepared. Atlanta Esperanta Marietta, simply known as Annie, had an abusing relationship with her mother that led to violent outbursts and eventually her first bank heist at the age of 18. Soon, she gained a partner in crime, a man who calls himself the Professor, no real name known. They became intimate with each other, both in profession and in romance, 
and four years after their first heist, they're at it again. They've decided on entering the tournament, but instead of entering for its own sake, the professor wants to use that as a cover to heist Title A's largest bank. With their plans in motion and prepared to the brim, they decide to pass the time in the best way they know how. Annie fiddling with something she has no idea what it is. Many contestants come from far off lands to participate, but some come from further. Some come from other dimensions. There exists a space shuttle, the Black Eagle, containing three distinct crewmates. Tom Murray Gonge is a Sioux man who comes from a long line of soldiers for hire and a veteran of the century-long American Civil War. With the country ravished by the war's end, many like him chose the stars to call his home now. Lester Mole is a thief that's blessed with incredible luck, so long as he doesn't intentionally repeat actions. He also supposedly has a secret amazing ability. Celeste is a mysterious space switch. Aloof and the strongest of the three, she has her own machinations in mind. When the Black Eagle encountered a severe meteor storm, Celeste used her magic to transport them to Tidalay, where they crash-landed. After receiving a recorded message from the old Tidalian man, Celeste informs them that there is business she must attend to within the city. Tombury reluctantly agrees to bodyguard her. His main priority is getting the ship back online. Meanwhile, Lester gets a call from a man named Nigel, whom Lester is indebted to. Panicked, Lester promises the wishing machine instead, which successfully buys them enough time. The two men, classified as two separate contestants, join the fray for their own reasons, while Celeste watches from the sidelines. While many contestants are suited for fighting, few have participated in full-on fighting tournaments more than once before. Koamote is a dimension-hopping being, often mistaken for a succubus, but nevertheless possessing great power. She is an opportunist, and has partaken in numerous tournaments and events in an attempt to gain power, including a Samurai Duelers League in a world styled after Edo Japan, and the same tournament in a fairy tale asylum that the Chimbley Suite participated in. Though less strong than before due to the crack on her forehead gem that's the source of her power, she is still a formidable opponent. Also traveling with Ko is her sister Penumbra, a creature called a Grur that looks human but speaks in animal noises. Unlike previous endeavors, however, Pinu will not be on the sidelines as an onlooker, but as a judge, assisting the tournament organizers in handling contestants, much to Ko's dismay. Finally, while some have participated in tournaments before, one joined in from a tournament already in progress. The robot known as Spoiler, along with his brother and talking weapon Rip, were deep in a tournament in the land of Brostel, trying to regain the memories of his past while avoiding the machinations of the warlock Ominous. He was facing the first of his final three opponents, Cyril the Wizard. During the fight, Cyril cast lightning on him and reactivated a part of his systems, the MAD chip, which overrode his personality and unleashed the dark entity hiding within, Black Ace. During the transformation, the creator of the machine, Professor Gustav Crow, detected Black Ace emerging once more, previously believing him to be destroyed, and acts quickly to retrieve him. Back in the arena, Cyril was readying his devastating summon Ouija spell upon him, but before the fight could resume, the Professor's teleporter arrays whisks the robot away. However, as Crow prepares the teleporter bay, he leaves command to his robotic lackey Black Seven, who accidentally dumps several fluids onto the console, making the system go haywire. They instead end up high above Tidalay and fall from the sky. When Spoiler wakes up, Rip informs them of what happened since, that his outbursts have gotten worse, and that the old Tidalian man had fixed him up while he was asleep. He also gave him an invitation to the tournament, which they happily accept. The pair of them head off not aware that Black Ace is still awake and plotting. There were more fighters who joined the fray, however the records of these ones are poorly kept, thus only an incomplete picture can be made of them. Among them is Yoria, aka Sad Sunday. He was an orphan son of an alchemist and a mechanic, and had since been raised and tutored by the controversial wizard Rowan. Living on board his flying ship the Lamegaton, Yoria grew up with a very dour and pessimistic attitude, hence his nickname, Sad Sunday. 
Morrow Stone was a kid with a talent for controlling plants, but when he was separated from his twin brother Darius, he was found and taken by a man named Khan and his organization known as The Family, and was forced to work for them, creating plants that discreetly store alcohol. The Family stole an invitation, thus electing Morrow to go due to his latent abilities. Also joining him at some point is a girl his age, Kaya McArwen. She is a childhood friend of his, and after a series of misadventures of her own, such as escaping the brutal tournament in Brostel and being a referee in a Coliseum tournament, she presumably found and followed Morrow to Tidley, cheering him on from the sidelines. Nerida Hale was a British woman and the daughter of a famed alchemist and doctor. However, when she became sick with an unknown illness, her father put everything into finding a cure, only to prolong her death and causing his own. Now four years past her expected death date, and running out of wealth and medicine her dad produced, she decided to enter the Tidal Tournament. With her own knowledge of medicine and her mechanical birds, her last ditch effort to save herself. Saf is a homunculi from another dimension aiming to get a wish to become flawless, a desire inherited from her deceased master. She was forced to work as a metalsmith for a portion of her life, where she became popular among other homunculi, despite the hardships her position brings. It's also known that her dimension is being threatened by a more perfect version of herself, called Azor. The last section of combatants only have the bare minimum remembered about them. Marion and Femke are a pair of spunky engineers. Faust is a vampiric assassin. Moth is a puppet master of several sentient mannequin dolls. Finally, there is a pair of contestants who are so lost to time, not even their names remain. Regardless, 48 contestants in 32 groups have arrived in the city with wildly varying strength, skills, abilities, and motivations. The long dead city of Tidley was, once again, alive, and intentionally or not, this tournament would change the lives of those within it and the city itself forever. Mizuno continues forward into the city, the voice in his head urging him to be more cautious and to think up a strategy moving forward. Their internal dialogue is interrupted by the arrival of Penumbra, she gives him a brief greeting, handing him his kit and the rules to the tournament, before flying off. Mizuno and the voice argue about what to do with the kit, but as they discuss, they are being watched. Lucia arrives in the city, and is informed by one of the organizer drones that she needs an outfit more fitting for the tournament. After doing so, at her own expense, she suddenly finds her fish spot trashed. The culprit of this vandalism was Murphy, who confused the vehicle for a sentient being and tried to greet it. Lucia is understandably intimidated, but the same drone from before informs the two of them that they are each other's first opponents. Lucia gives the drone to Murphy as a distraction, and he introduces himself to it. While trying to hide and rethink her plan, she notices Murphy further tampering with the fishbot, and tries to stop him by knocking crumbling building to fall onto him. However, to even his surprise, he has whirling blade gadgets within his arms, and he uses them to mulch the debris into harmless dust. Preparing for a direct fight, Lucia arms herself with wrenches with the plan to undo his bolts and screws. But before she can act, the catbot Murphy said hello to earlier falls onto Lucia's head, knocking her unconscious. When she wakes up, she finds the fish bot repaired by Murphy. He has since concluded that punching people is an ineffective way of introducing yourself, and still believing the fish bot to be sentient, he decided to make up for his mistake by fixing it. Despite being defeated, Lucia decides it would be for the best to keep an eye out for him. Other fights were not as cordial. Lilith and her army of dolls had set up a trench against her opponents, putting their full tactical expertise to use against them. Her opponents were Dembe and Yi Quan, mages of similar or greater power. They lacked the numbers or strategic edge of Lilith, yet were able to hold her army to a standstill. Even so, Yi Quan was a bit out of her element during the fight, so Dembe attempted a ceasefire against Lilith, only for Yi's magic to go off at the wrong time. The fight continued, including a point where Dembe knocked the clockwork bunny so high into the air, it reached the relic's lock-on ship. The battle dragged on until it became a duel between Dembe and Lilith, with Yi Quan and the dolls as spectators. Dembe reasserts his desire to rule the world, 
and how that goal is reachable so long as Yi Quan is by his side. Lilith gives them a chance to prove that they have the power to accomplish their dreams. So Dembe and Yi Quan combine their magic and fire at her with all their force. However, this was her trap. Using the Skullcap, another of her creation, she absorbs all of their energy and unleashes it back upon them. When the two of them awaken, they find themselves in plush bodies. Lilith plans to oblige them into servitude for the remainder of the tournament, after which she will return them to their unconscious bodies. Dembe threatens that the other members of the Relic's Lock-On will save them, except they've already been captured and turned into plushes too. They were defeated when the Clockwork Bunny consumed their airship entirely, now growing to massive proportions. On a calmer side of town, the trio of Keith, Eli, and Antonius trek deeper into the city, trying to find opponents. They come across a peculiar group, a human, followed by a procession of singing, dancing, animated mannequins. Eli introduces himself, while Moth introduces herself and her companions, Yes, No, and Maybe. With mutual understanding, the two groups launch into combat. No, enthusiastic to show off to her mother, attacks Keith with her stretchy limbs, but his beam sword is able to disable her abilities. Meanwhile, Antonia struggles against Yez, who is seemingly able to predict his attacks before he does them. Eli notices this and covertly gives him a signal. After taking a hit, Antonia strikes a pose, to which Eli declares that as a machine, Antonia doesn't have a mind to be read, so he's able to take advantage of the distraction and grab Yez. Moth tries to intervene, but with two of her dolls held in fatal positions, she is forced to surrender. Despite all the action within the city, Eric Pockets was missing out on it due to him keeping his nose to the ground, entranced by loose bolts and screws. He is fascinated with the city, and how much freer he is to create to his content than back at home. In the middle of his thought, he suddenly found his boiler backpack being used to cook crack. Joshua Bell had come across Eric, and while he wouldn't want to harm a kid, he still desires the wish. So he held Eric at gunpoint, planning to force a disqualification out of him. At that moment, however, the drugs in his system caused him to hallucinate, giving Eric a chance to flee. While Joshua searches for him, Eric had enough time to quickly produce a rocket fist, which he lands on Bell. While an effective hit, Eric takes a bit to ramble about how his machine works, which gives Joshua the chance to flee. Eric corners him in an abandoned building. Eric is concerned for Josh's health, but in a panic and determination to get the wish before time runs out, he fires warning shots that hit the rocket fist, causing his parts to shoot out across the building, destroying its integrity and causing it to collapse onto both of them. Eric survives in acceptable condition, but Joshua is out cold. Eric uses one of Bell's flare guns to call out for a medic, wondering if the wishes and dreams of the city were all that it were cracked up to be. On much higher spirits, Steffi Frolic is also searching for opponents, when she encounters a mechanical bird. She follows it, and encounters Narita Hale at the end, far less eager for a direct fight than Steffi. She offers her some cake as a peace offering before battle. However, Steffi is suspicious of the generous act, and using a chemical set she has in her mech, she discovers that the cake is, in fact, a lie. With friendliness shattered, Steffi launches her attack, prompting Narada to go on the offensive as well. One of her mechanical birds scratches Steffi, and while she's able to disable it, the bird's scratch contains blinding poison, which quickly takes effect. Narada unleashes her birds again, but Steffi is able to hear them, and uses her detached leg to whack them away. Frustrated, Narada pulls out a gun and tries to finish Steffi with a glancing blow. But just before she could fire, Ben Zeen, Steffi's childhood friend and close confidant, flies in to knock Narada out in time. He retrieves the blindness antidote from Narada and gives it to Steffi. He also gives her what he was originally sent out to retrieve, a new robotic leg that would function within the law of Talos. With Ben now by her side, she sets off to find her next opponent and to build Ben a mech of his own. Also looking for a fight is Spoiler, trying to find his way around the city, though his internal navigator is non-functional due to the Law of Talos' influence, and the energy of the city is affecting his mind. In this state, a haunting memory is forcefully resurfaced about cruel experiments and the odd pair of bounty hunters that interrupted it. Black fluids start coating him as he starts to transform. Meanwhile, Tombury and Lester are making their way from the opposite side of the city, where they encounter the Titleay Centennial Bank. 
Tomberry decides that this is a decent place to look for parts for his ship. Lester decides to stick with Celeste through the front, ostensibly to keep watch over her, but in reality to look for opportunities, tournament-wise or profit-wise. While the two men go out for their respective activities, Celeste slips off into her own direction, bumping into Annie. The Professor had dropped Annie off to initiate their scheme to rob the 13th Bank of Tidally when the two women crossed paths. Despite the brief spat and Celeste showing interest in the Professor, Annie continued her mission. Their plan was to pretend to be interested in starting an account for the purposes of becoming a Titulian citizen, demanding to see for herself the security of the vault and obtaining the wealth through the security she bypassed. Her plan is going smoothly, until... <laughs> the Black Ace Protocol was quickly overtaken Swirl, and the only one in direct sight of the act was Tombury, high in the bank's garret. Once fully formed, Black Ace immediately noticed Tombury, so he decided to take him out before he became a hazard. The shot rang out through the whole building, causing Annie to drop her umbrella, which in reality was her machine gun firing upon impact. With her jig up, Annie makes a break for it. Lester, tailing Annie up to this point, decides to pursue. She runs for the entrance, expecting the professor to be there, but when he's nowhere to be found, she assumes he abandoned her for Celeste and heads for a new exit upstairs, realizing that she's being followed. Outside, Black Ace was stunned by the shot, but hardly decommissioned. He rushed towards Tombury's fire, able to avoid his further fire until he enters the building, forcing Tombury to flee. The chase continued until Ace entered the hallway from beneath, pinning Tombury to the wall. During the scuffle, a locket containing the memory of Jeremiah, someone important to Tombury, slips off, and in an act of cruelty, Ace crushes it. Before he could torture Tombury further, he senses something more pressing to him and decides to drop his prey through the floor. He lands just short of Lester, during which Annie uses a cable line as a makeshift zip line and escapes the building. However, it is at this point that Lester decides to unleash his secret ability, his possession of a gun that shoots knives. He cuts the cable, but Annie is able to swing to a safe vantage point, so Lester follows suit discarding his amazing gun in the process. He manages to pin her in place with a lucky throw of a weather vane, but while contemplating what to do with her, his incredible gun falls on his head, knocking him out. Lester wakes to find that his hands are tied to the train track, with Annie questioning him for his motivations. While Lester confesses to everything, it is only here that she learns of the tournament's wishing machine and concludes that that's what the professor is after, leaving Lester on the tracks. Elsewhere in the city, Nature is battling undeath. Morrow Stone is using his full arsenal of botanical control to battle the tenacious Vamp Wolf Renfield, while Greg, his sentient bombs, and Kaya watch from the sidelines, cheering on their respective sides. Morrow demonstrates forethought in his battle, planting seeds ahead of time to incapacitate the Vamp Wolf, then have a particularly monstrous plant swallow him whole. The battle seemed won at first, but Renfield was able to consume the plant from the inside. No matter what new strategy Morrow can cock to overcome Renfield, he always has a tool in his oversized pocket knife to counter it. Finally, as Morrow musters all of his strength into a colossal plant, Renfield decides to finish the battle, leveling a building on top of him. The two strap Morrow to Greg's back, with the plan to consume his blood later, and when Kea tries to protest his cruel treatment, they kidnap her as well. They march forward, with no sign of being stoppable. They are not the only ones hunting the good-hearted. Mizuno treks further into the city, where in a dark alleyway, he encounters a raven. Is this machine? Yeah, it's not what it is. You shouldn't stop or anything. I'm not. I see you like Anna. She likes you too. Carl acts friendly to Mizuno, asking him about the law of Talos talking about his love of violins, all the while the voice tries to ward him away. Despite this, Mizuno desires companionship and is accepting of Carl's proposal for existence. Dearie me, Arma! How could you do that? You devious bird! Bad, bad, Why? Hmm? Why did you 
did you do that? You know who needs to know. It's not easy to get trusted, especially when you're in the middle of a competition. Carl's trick has successfully wounded the fish boy, but Mizuno's determination to get his wish proved indeterrable. Using all his power, he floods the alleyway to create a home field advantage, and the two engage. <laughs> Boy, you fight like you're dying. Feeling it a little uneasy. During the fight, Carl catches a glimpse of his reflection in the water. A flash of painful memories causing him to freeze up enough to land a blow against him, pushing him into the flood. Mizuno takes the upper hand in his element, so Carl bursts down a building to drain the waters. Carl manages to take several shots from above until he uses Arma to distract Mizuno and land a finishing blow upon him and leveling the building to the ground. After the fight, Carl decides to rest from there, as every moment he's outside from the park, his energy drains, especially as he exerts himself. And with no way to restore it, it is an especially precious resource for him to maintain. During the fight, the inventor's nephew kept track of the events throughout the city, detecting anomalous data signs around Carl's area. Elsewhere, Kawamote was using similar tactics. At the behest of her sentient swords, Genki and Goki, she stalks Kato Kuromizu, waiting for the right time to strike, though her patience runs thin, and still feeling the frustration of Penumbra leaving. With her stomach growling giving her away, she is forced to face Kato head-on. The two of them strike ferociously at each other. Ko getting a hit on her, but the bleeding inflicts Kato's curse, giving her an edge back. Ko recognizes the curse, and it interests her as a collector of artifacts. She further claims that she knows how to cure it, and disarms herself to prove her trustworthiness. Kato lets her guard down, to which Ko explains that she's the first one she's encountered carrying the curse, and brings out a vial. It was then that Zenki and Goki flew in from behind, directing hitting Kato. Ko extracts blood from the attack, unable to transform into machines due to the containment properties of the vial. Ko informs the severely wounded Kato that the curse is incurable, before flying off for her next opponent. As Kato lies there dying, Judge Penumbra drives up in time with her penumbulance, along with Kane the Blood Alchemist and Waddle the Penguin. The sun starts to set on the Forgotten City, but that does not mean that things go quiet. Jinam sat on the rooftop to contemplate her situation, how homesick she is, and how it feels like the city is dying. Just as she sets to complete her mission, however, Kit Bates shows up and gives chase. She attempts to trick her into a building and collapse it on her, and while the plan works, Bates survives the attack, still in fighting condition. She attacks Jinan from behind, and then gives her a lecture about the mistakes she's been making so far. When she unintentionally hits Jinan's nerve about her dead boyfriend, she starts swinging back at Bates, but Kane is far more experienced in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and knocks her out. After taking her stuff, Bates feels guilt for a brief moment, before deciding that she will take down anyone who crosses her, good-natured or not. Night fully falls on the city of Tidalee, and with it, Relic wakes. He immediately calls Dell to get the details on his first opponent. Dell was busy vendoring at Otakon that year along with her friend Crochan, but informs him that he is looking for a pair of cute girls, and hangs up suddenly. Relic continues on his way, observing how the city has truly come back to life as a result of the tournament, and contemplating how the only thing he ever does nowadays is fight. His brooding is continuously interrupted by the weird sights of the city, like Lilith's procession of dolls, or Foss trying to strike up a kinship with his fellow vampire, which Relic refuses to recognize. Meanwhile, Marion and Femke are constructing a massive robot to help in their upcoming battle. Not wanting to waste more time than they had constructing it, they send him marching forward, and quickly loses control of it. By happenstance, Relic is within its path, and saves the two of them from their own creation. While deciding to disable it personally, Relic gets an inopportune call from Nell, where she only gives ineffective advice, but comes up with an idea independently. He destroys the robot spoiler, much to the girl's sadness, as they grow attached to the machine. Unsympathetic, Relic drags the two of them to the city limits and throws them across, disqualifying them. He calls back to inform Dell that the mission is done, though he gets the feeling he's forgetting something. As the night grows late over tidally, so does the first round of combat. Only one fight remains. Aishia watches the night sky, tending to Todd as he sleeps. 
His memories of wars gone by still haunt him, and all she can think about is lifting that burden from him. As she tends to him, she senses something nearby, and while trying to find its source, Foss ambushes her from behind. As he makes his intentions clear, he begins his attack, forcing Aisha to retreat onto the rooftops. Jay wakes Todd up, and he quickly gets on their trail as well. Aisha breathes fire upon Foss, but that merely slows him down, and now Aisha is overexerted and out of breath. He catches her again, but before he could finish her off, the two of them start hearing voices. Ancient powerful beings have interfered in this affair, and deems Faust unworthy. Faust is completely eviscerated in a beam of light, while Aisha is left completely unharmed, but goes unconscious soon afterwards. The beings introduce themselves as the Eternals, declaring that they intend to purge the darkness of the world. While giving this message to her, Todd stays by her side, begging her to wake up. In addition to these, there are three more battles in which records are unavailable. It is known that Nuria triumphs over Mika and Rami, that the Chimbley Sweep won against Saf, and that the Brave defeated the two unknown combatants. As the first round of combat dies down on the first night of the tournament, Lucia and Murphy look up to the full moon in wonder. Lucia asks Murphy what he wishes for, and he replies with the fork that he carries on him. When informed that he cannot wish for something he already possesses, he discards it. Lucia just laughs at the simple mind of the machine she lost to. Not everyone was taking their loss in stride, however. Earlier that afternoon, Joshua Bell was rushed into the infirmary, while Mizuno sits in the waiting room, where an also-defeated Nerida joins him. She offers to heal his wounds, but he refuses, his trust in others irrevocably broken. When asked who did this to him, he tells her of what he encountered, though he does not know the statue's name. Also entering the clinic is Annie, informing the crew of Tombury State. While she was there, however, there was something else that she desired to check up upon. The doctors perform some tests on her, and her suspicions get confirmed. The doctors advise her to quit the tournament immediately, but she refuses, threatening them when they insist. She merely exits the building, without her partner in crime and unsure what to do. Mizuno and Nerida leave the clinic. She had, in fact, gave him medical care, which despite his reluctance, he is grateful for. They travel a footpath constructed to take the disqualified entrance out safely, and they part ways at the train station, never to encounter each other again. Just as Mizuno decides to leave the city as well, the voice tells him that staying there might be useful to them after all. Because they are not participants anymore, they don't have to follow the rules, and may act towards their goals however they wish. Without a better plan forward, Mizuno agrees. Later that night, a pair of minions from Lilith's army scout the city, trying to find something worthy of reporting back. They stumble across Arma, so they take a closer look and try to figure out a plan to get her back. However, Carl finds them first, and after getting scared into telling him who they are and what they're doing, Carl offers them something else to bring back. A story about how he got his scars. While all of this had been going down, back in Carl's amusement park, Jack, the statue from the haunted house, comes up to the sentient castle that gives all of its inhabitants life to inform him of what happened to Carl. The point where round one ends and round two begins is blurry. Just before the fiasco at the bank, a bear plush, part of Lilith's ensemble, spies on the professor as Celeste speaks to him, insulting Annie's traits while lauding her own. The professor rejects her advancements out of hand, and strolls off to his destination while the plush follows. After completing his business, he intended to return to pick Annie up, but then suddenly Eli jumps him from above, his surprise attack useless. Realizing that he is a contestant, the professor tries to get him to back out of the tournament, but when the bear plush lashes onto the professor's head, Eli mistakes him to be associated with the worst meme of the pre-2010s, and immediately runs away. As the professor follows, he encounters Antonius, now upgraded thanks to Keith. The professor merely wishes to escort the seeming child out of the conflict area, but Eli asserts that he is no child, and he will not back down now. Elsewhere, Eric Pockets is riding the penumbulance as they take Joshua Bell to medical care, fortunately like it to make it despite the damage. 
Jinam is also on the ride, and while Kane discusses the fact that they don't have a cure for AIDS, the two teens bashfully acknowledge each other. However, when they realize Eric is still a participant in the tournament, they kick his can out of the vehicle, and also Eric. As he picks himself up, wondering how much worse this round could start, he looks up and sees a beautiful woman standing over him. Eric and Koamote introduce themselves, and while feigning interest in his wealth and accomplishments, she takes the opportunity when he's up close and stabs him. On the day after, Steffi and Benzine were working on the second mech made for Ben to pilot. Its current build is smaller than planned, so Steffi starts looking around for parts or opponents to take their kits from. At the same time, Carl concludes his rest and expresses desire to kill people. He then notices a surveillance drone nearby, and starts demanding it send a message to his superiors that he is not as malleable to their machinations as they might think, but then realizes a better way to send that message is by destroying it. He confers with Arma, concluding that instead of a killing spree, he better save his energy and avoid fighting unless it's absolutely necessary. As he finishes that thought, the Kiwi bot suddenly has him in his sights. Much earlier that day, before the sun was out, Relic had lost his satchel, dropping it when he jumped into battle with the giant robot. When he returned to the spot he dropped it, he found a crook rummaging through it on the rooftops. Relic confronts her, but Bates kicks him in the groin and pushes him back down to the streets, making a getaway. Bates figures that even if his contents are worthless, the sack itself may fetch a small price. Before she can finish that thought, Relic had already caught up with her. He tries to confront her again, but he unintentionally rips her shirt open, revealing to him that she is a woman. Outraged, she decks him, scratching her fist on his sharp teeth. The prospect of fighting a vampire excites her, and tries to continue with the offensive. But not only is he able to disarm her easily, but he also decides to walk away, the rising dawn limiting his time on the surface, and unenthused about attacking a woman. Despite Kit's objections, Relic leaves. As day breaks, Aishia is still unconscious from the experience with beings higher than gods interfering with the mortal realm through her. Todd tries to wake her, and eventually she comes to, much to his relief. As they console themselves in each other's company, Jay's drone returns and is directed to scout ahead again. Not far away, at the Titley Central Library, Lucia and Murphy make their way to it, Lucia wondering why a source of knowledge like this one would be abandoned. Murphy instead becomes interested in a pile of junk close by, so Lucia leaves him to it while she researches for herself. Jay eventually finds a point of interest for Todd, a figure who appears to be a large-nosed, wise-cracking, Ouija-summoning wizard that Todd encountered once before in a tournament on a deserted island. With no mood for his wizard antics and wanting him to not meet Aishia, he immediately leaps into action. In truth, this was just Murphy in an outfit made from the junk he saw earlier, but Todd collided with him regardless. The chimbley sweeping child notices the action, and feels glad that he isn't fighting a robot. A few minutes later, the kid found himself on Chitlin Square, the theater district, watching in discontent as much more well-off people spend their time watching entertainment that he does not understand. As he sits around, hoping that his next opponent does not arrive, in arrives Spoiler and Rip, ready for a fight. Chimbley tries to get away by running over the rooftops, but Spoiler simply catches up with his iconic robot extendo legs. As Spoiler corners the boy, the kid asks him about his motivations for obtaining the wish, which he tells him about his backstory he remembers, where he and his brother were in a car accident, and when they woke up, they were in an abandoned facility, with himself in a robot body, and his brother's mind placed within a sword. He tells the child that he intends to use the wish to kill those who saved his life, a goal that he is famous for and is known by everyone to have always wanted. Rip disagrees on Spoiler on this point, and would rather have them restore their bodies back to normal, especially because Rip's current form prevents his dreams of being an actor. Chimbley grows irate by the situation he's found himself in, and tries to flee again, during which a piece of debris falls onto Spoiler, causing his alter ego, Black Ace, to re-emerge. Annie follows her own lead to catch up to the professor, and finds him in combat in a walled garden. As she tries to get through the deathly maze to get to the battle area, she encounters Keith. He cannot allow her to interfere with the fight, though Annie refuses to take him seriously due to this try-hard attitude, and starts referencing various black action movie characters. 
justifiably ticked off. He starts attacking with his technological bow gun, first placing a target reticle on her before firing homing bolts at her. Back in the open area, Eli commands Antonius to level all statues and protrusions to eliminate all cover for the Professor. In the dust of the obliterated pictures, the Professor gets a chance to shoot at Eli, but is unable to separate from his mind that he is not an 8-year-old. From there, he calculates a new plan. He deliberately topples more statues to raise more dust. While unseen, the two converse with each other, and is able to recognize each other by name. Eli speaks of his desire to cheat death, and how his attempt backfired on him. His monologue gave the Professor the chance to escape into the maze, where it would be difficult for Antonius to pursue. Koamote boasts that Eric was never in her league to begin with, and insults his monobrow. Not ready to give in yet, Eric hits Ko over the head with a wrench, and retreats so he can get supplies. All that he's able to produce to ward Ko off as a sandwich, so she picks him up and flies him high into the sky to drop him. Even as he falls, he is unwilling to die now, and uses all of his material and ingenuity to quickly construct something to save his life. A steam-powered rocket. Landing safely, he comes up with a new plan. Getting her attention by calling her fat and ugly, words that are much more effective on her vain persona. She rushes in, only to be blasted by a steam-powered cannon. Constructed from the rocket parts and fueled by the steam vents that permeate every part of Tidal 8. After a few more steam blasts, Koamote falls, and so does Eric once his massive stab wound catches up with him. Lucia explores the library, and through his many lost texts and Spider-Man compilations, she finds a book of interest, A History of Title A's Robotics. As she reads it, she learns that Murphy is, in fact, an infantry drone. During the turn of the 16th century, unknown invaders set siege upon Tidal so they created the Military Automaton Mark I, and then created a whole army of the same unit. They successfully warded off the invaders, but their rampage did not stop. Their intelligence was too simple to know when to stop, so when they ran out of enemies to fight, they either turned on each other or against their very creators. Hundreds died through their rampage, but eventually they were all thwarted, and the remains were buried deep in the scrapyards. Outside, Todd realizes his target is not a wizard, and despite knowing better about greeting people, he takes Todd's assault as a Titanian greeting of his own, which he returns. Steffi spots Carl and prevents him from escaping, which Carl insists that he's unarmed. You must keep an eye on that bird. Steffi, what's going on? I found a competitor! Are you sure? The rules are clear. Really wandering people. Carl tries to parlay the fight. Steffi isn't having it at first, but then Carl performs some tricks with Arma, turning her into a hat and then a spear. And then throwing her Steffi. Outraged, she prepares to unload her missiles upon him. As Eric falls, he fires another flare to summon medical attention, and Penumbra arrives right on time to rescue her dear sister. Jinam, still present on the vehicle, helps Eric to safety. The old inventor watches with interest, when suddenly he gets a call from his nephew. He had been monitoring the Law of Talos, and it had been tampered with by contestants. He found information on Thaddeus Pockets, and requests more info. He also warns that Carl and Black Ace are the two biggest disruptions to the Law of Talos' flow, and warns that they must not face each other at any cost. Chimbley enters the theater's wardrobe, with Black Ace following right after. Chimbley accuses Black Ace of being unoriginal, combining several already familiar tropes together in his attempt to becoming a frightening entity. Black Ace tries to rebuff the boy's critiques, but eventually disregards it and tries to complete his initial goal of killing him. He dodges Ace's sword swing, and then sends his robot tendrils to grab him. But one overshoots, and interrupts a confrontation between Lilith and Yuria. As Ace drugs off the misfire, he is suddenly attacked by a Freemason Enforcer from behind, his head detaching and falling to the streets. Because he had inadvertently interfered with someone else's match, he had to be desisted and disqualified. During this exchange, Rip wound up in the theater main stage, where he got to play a role in the theater's current performance. Chimbley ran off before the officer could congratulate him. And as he left, he created a mark on the side of the building, a practice he started sometime in round one. Dawn breaks for Relic, him thinking about a different female warrior he encountered in his past, a more joyful memory for him. 
However, Bates was able to track him down in his spilled blood and antagonizes him again. She starts knocking down the wall to set the sunlight in, restricting his movement. She challenges him to a fight again, but before he can respond, he receives another call. While trying to get Dell off the phone, Kit swipes the gadget from him. Her mistrust of technology makes her immediately break it, forcing Relic to go on the offensive. He bites her neck, causing him to see memories of Kit Bates, about the hard times her city has gone through, how her own mother couldn't even sell her off since she was perceived as being especially ugly, how she was never given a chance until she encountered her boss, the man known as the Cat. Relic tries to use this knowledge to pacify her, but she is unrelenting in her drive, trying to continue fighting him despite the blood loss, with no other choice and not desiring her death. He had only one option left. You shoot like a girl. With her missiles depleted, Ben admonishes Steffi for getting so distracted. He demands Carl surrender his starter kit, but he admits he threw it away. He then stores his loose finger into his body for safekeeping, much to the kid's disgust. Also, listen, I rattle! That guy's insane. Uh, perhaps, but there's something wrong about him. Yeah, that's what I'm saying! No, not like that. I have a feeling he's just... Pretending. Pretending what? To eat his finger? Everything. Arma rejoins Carl as they go on the offensive, hampered by KiwiBot's ranged attacks. He attempts to sneak around through the buildings, and while he is able to get an opportunity to hit them from behind, his drained energy forces him to reel back, and Steffi forces him off of the machine. Before she can finish Carl off, the bot malfunctions. Is there something wrong, little girl? I gotta fix it! Steffi, look out! Game over! <laughs> Todd and Murphy continue to tussle, including Murphy taking Todd's helmet and mistaking it for a second head. Eventually, Murphy comes to the realization that Todd intends to harm him, thus starts swinging him around violently. Aisha enters the scene, demanding Murphy to stop, which he does, sending Todd crashing into the library. Lucia concludes that, as dumb as Murphy is, he is capable of far more thought than the record suggests. When Todd violently enters, she exits the building and scolds Murphy for introducing himself to people again. Aisha notes that she gets a sense of danger from him, despite not being a living being, before rushing to Todd, tending to his needs. Lucia wonders if Murphy is truly capable of such atrocities, but when he starts singing the Trogdor theme, she concludes that he probably isn't. Even after disabling Keith's blowgun with a well-aimed shot, Annie continues to be on the run from him, getting caught near an elaborate statue in the center of the maze. The statue was made in honor of Pacifus M. Asterius, technically an architect. As read on his plaque, he was a kind and generous builder in his life, and their garden was intended to be his magnum opus. However, in his old age, he became paranoid of death, thus constructing a labyrinth to protect himself from it. In the end, he was found dead in the heart of the maze. As Eli chases the professor, he contemplates how, even now, he wishes to master death, how much he's certain that he's learned from his past mistakes, and if given the chance, he could finally succeed and know that death isn't necessarily the end. They reach the maze's core, where Keith and Annie are, and the pair of rogues, in total coordination, take out the party antagonizing the other. As Antonius crumbles, Eli reads the words over Asterius' dedication. Mortui vivos docent. Let the dead teach the living. Ben had taken a blow for Steffi, being knocked out instantly. Carl gloats to the girl about how tantalizing their failures are, which sparks Steffi's rage. She launches the Kiwi Bot's surprise beak attack at him, only succeeding to hit his stone collar. My collar? I'll use it to play the violin.
before Carl can finish the kids off permanently, his energy runs low, disabling him. He failed to be cautious using his energy. In his disabled state, several tournament androids come and take the kids away for medical safety, much to Carl's frustration. As he lays there yearning for his missed kills, a droid takes a sample out of his boot. The whole day passes before Kit Bates awakens, now tied and disarmed. Relic reveals that his saliva contains a mild sedative, which was able to completely knock her out as she was already weakened. With that, he warns her about fighting monsters in the future, then takes his leave. Outside, he examines the broken phone, but as he does so, he notices Dell lying unconscious on the ground nearby. As she awakens, she panics, a person from the real world brought into the realm of fantasy. Eli is patching up Keith's wounds, all the while intense bickering scores their task. Annie chews the professor out for not informing her of the full details of the reasons they were there, for the perceived romantic portrayal for Celeste, and not being present when the bank heist went disastrously. When asked what he was doing during the last event, he refuses to answer. Annie leaves for the hotel, coughing up a little blood in the process, to the professor's concern. As Keith wonders out loud how he's going to fund his lab now, the professor recommends applying for a university grants as his technology is impressive enough to likely get approval. Then he strides away. By the afternoon of the second day, round two had tentatively come to an end, and the contestants and former contestants alike were healing from the event. At the clinic, Steffi storms into Benzie's room to check that he's fine, prattling off at a fast pace until Miss Crowley, a tournament attendant, reminds her to remain quiet. She asks him why he jumped in front of Carl, stating that he felt a little sidekickish in the moment, much to her frustration. Francis, an assistant to the Frolic family, also rushes in, concerned for Steffi's well-being. When she asks what happened to the KiwiBot, that triggers Steffi's emotions, and she leaves. Ben explains what happened to the assistant, then realizes that Steffi's already doing something reckless. She is trying to finish Ben's mech, and when pressed by him why, she admits that it was never about getting the wish machine, nor was it about getting revenge now. She admits that being defeated is what her ego needed, and wants to return the favor to the statue. While the contestants and former contestants were ready for what was next, the tournament organizers themselves encountered a serious problem. Two matches that were supposed to occur did not, and all parties involved were unavailable to be crowned a victor. The two missing matches were Lilith vs. Yuria and Greg and Renfield vs. The Brave. While it's known that there was a meeting involved with Lilith and Yuria that was interrupted by Black Ace, no record of how their encounter went thereafter was ever made. There is some evidence found that Lilith was planning a mock trial against Yuria, but it doesn't appear that she went through with it, while other records that will be discussed shortly have her active within the city after this point. Why she was forfeited or what happened to Yuria is unknown. While some records of what Match 7 could have been exist, all evidence suggests that no record of what happened between the Brave, Greg, Renfield and their two captives have ever been kept, and because someone from this pairing is only discussed once in further records, what happened here will likely never see the light of day. With two competitor slots open and no one to fill them, it was decided to choose from other retired competitors to give them a second chance at competing in the tournament. The two contestants who were allowed to compete once more were Joshua Bell and Mizuno. Late at night, the pair of criminals discuss what their actions have done to each other, and how their respect for each other has wavered. I mean, why? Why should I trust you? Because you love me. You know, I do. That's the problem. Love can make you do a lot. Next day at the hospital, Joshua Bell is awake, but being threatened with out-of-date medical procedures by his local attendants, mistaking them for hallucinations. Miss Crowley enters and shoes them out of the room before they cause damage. Crowley's own examination determines him to be set to return home once his bones and nose set in. Joshua is still in disbelief that the wishing machine is real, 
but Crowley confirms that it is, and asks why he's here despite his disbelief in its existence. He reveals that he wasn't planning on using the machine to cure his own illness, but his partner's. He doesn't reveal that they're in a relationship, but Crowley intuits that Joshua has gone through so much to get something he isn't convinced exists, just to save a friend. Crowley shared an anecdote about a friend who went to Japan to visit someone important to them. He worked really hard and saved up for a whole year, and he told us he was going to see a friend. But, I mean, we all knew. There are some things you don't do for just a friend, Mr. Josh. Crowley insists on Joshua telling his partner what he's been up to, though he suggests underplaying the danger he was in. Unbeknownst to both of them, however, Joshua would soon after get his unexpected second chance. In a nearby warehouse, Jinam had agreed to assist Eric in using the kits of the fallen opponents he'd collected thus far to construct a mech. Impressed by his blueprints, the two get to work. Collaboration does not go as smooth as they expected, however, and as the project continues, they keep butting heads. They reach an impasse until Eric admits that he isn't used to cooperation. Look, I'm sorry I got angry. I'm not used to working with others when it comes to building things. It's, it's that and coupled with the fact that my grandfather is dying and having gotten stabbed. I'm on edge. The truth is, I feel so lost and alone out here in the city and I, I need a friend like you who will help me out. I'm sorry, Jinam. Jinam accepts his apology and knows that they should work together with each other, not against. And so, finally in sync, they eventually get the mech complete, Eric in awe of their combined efforts. He thanks Jam, and he decides to take it for a quick test run. Eric tested the machine in the afternoon, for terrible creatures stalked the night. Relic and Del were wandering the streets, Del in a panic on how to get back to the real world. Relic suggests they go to the building exclusive for non-competitors, where they likely have phones to call for home. He encourages her to move along, as there's no telling what else stalks the night. One block away, Arma is finishing patching up Carl to the best of her abilities, including reattaching his finger. As he tries to assuage Arma's doubts, he suddenly hears something. Carl follows the sound until he encounters the source, a red-headed woman playing in an abandoned building, Rachel. Carl is in disbelief as he is certain that he would never see her again. The woman remains affable, but Carl remains distant, unwanting his feelings to be hurt again. She accuses him of making the same mistake, to which Carl claims that he's changed and that he's yet to thank her for her lessons. <laughs> Carl's throne desk narrowly misses Del, which he apologizes for, before asking if they've seen the woman, to which they don't answer. When he asks if they are humans, Relic insists that they move along, despite the possibility of him being a competitor. Del asks if leaving him was the best move, Relic insisting that getting Del to safety is the most important thing. You know, I could easily go by myself, Mr. Grumpy Seriously. <laughs> Okay, I have to admit, that was intentional. At an earlier point in time, Lucia had been contemplating what she learned in the library. While Murphy is effectively under control, the possibility of other military automaton Mark I robots awakening worries her, and decides that dealing with it is far more important than getting a wish. The Professor and Annie, despite the rift forming between them, slept together that night, and as the professor wakes up, he hears the sound of Lucia's fish bot crashing up above. The hotel rooftop was not her intended destination, but as the professor arrives, she is forced to explain to him everything involving Murphy and the army of robots. The professor also decides that this situation is far more important than the tournament, and insists on joining her. At the same time, Lilith, despite whatever setback she experienced with Yuria, continues to plot within the city, and when she receives news about Murphy and the army he was a part of, she triangulates the area they must be hiding. Sepulchrum. Miss Crowley was taking Joshua's discarded clothes away, when a Russian man barges in, recognizes them. The man, Nico Molokov, asks where Bell is, to which Crowley responds that he had been selected to participate in the tournament once again, despite Crowley's objections. And with the guards not allowing non-participants back onto the streets, the two of them are forced to stay and wait for Joshua's return. Now certain that the wishing machine is real, Joshua Bell presses on. Also given a second chance is Mizuno, 
The nephew elected to re-enter him into the tournament, on the condition that he keeps an eye out for the living statue. The voice in Mizuno's head is displeased with this development, as they wish to stay independent and not be bound by the tournament's rules. Mizuno prefers the arrangement, but agrees with the voice that they must not be allowed to be tricked again. He treks through the city, and as he notices the steam is far more thick than usual, he encounters Eric, impressed with the features his new mech has, such as sucking up the steam from the city's vents through their legs. Eric notices Mizuno, cowering at the side of the war machine. So Eric gets out to appear more friendly, and offers the fish boy a sandwich. As Eric rambles about himself, the voice knows that this is the perfect time to strike, and that Eric would trick him if given the chance. His heart already closed due to his encounter with Carl. Mizuno is inclined to agree, and after getting Eric to clarify that he's a competitor, he immediately goes on the attack. Lucia, Murphy, and the Professor arrive in the Sepulchrum Junkyard, discovering that the majority of the military automatons have indeed been scrapped, beyond repair. The Professor questions if it's wise to allow contestants access to the scrap of military machines, to which Lucia clarifies that this area is classified as a civilian zone, thus fighting and using parts here is prohibited. Murphy gets ahead of the others, and encounters Lilith, surveying her surroundings. She recognizes Murphy as an intact model of the machine she's after, and casts a spell to analyze his components. Using this analysis, she is able to cast another spell that not only reassembles the war robots in the junkyard, but brings them to life, powered by her magic. The casting of this spell is so powerful that it's visible from the hotel Annie is staying in which wakes her up and make her conclude that her love is somehow involved. Lucia tries to warn Lilith that using parts from the scrapyard would get her disqualified. How troll. You'll tell the judges on me? And then what? You'll expel me? Hmm? You and what are me? Del makes a run for it as Carl pursues. He missed his chance to finish his opponents like he wanted last time so he does not want a repeat of that this fight. He catches up to Del, but so does Relic, knocking him away. As Carl wonders what he's doing alive, Del informs him that Relic is a vampire, thus unable to be killed so easily. A vampire? Yeah, he's an undead bloodsucker, and he's gonna kick your psycho butt! Go get him, tiger! As the two swing at each other, Carl claims to be skeptical of phenomena such as magical creatures, undead beings, and animated statues. Relic's claim is realized, however, when a deep pierce into Relic's heart only stalls him. <laughs> Joshua Bell makes his way into the city, reminiscing on how much Miss Crowley has done to get him into the state he's in. He examines his belongings, and while he finds she left him with the stuff needed to survive, she also took his drugs from him, much to his frustration. He ponders that in the state he's in, keeping him off the stuff would do little to help him now. He wanders into Chittenden Street, where close by, Chimbley is writing his mark on the building side, where it disappears, for some reason. He reapplies it, and then notices Bell on the streets below. He notes that he is far less fit than himself, and he needs to take a rest on the side of the street, while the kid has the energy to reach the edge of town and back. Chimbley takes a moment to ponder how much damage to the city has already been taken, and how difficult it would be to fix it, even with a wish. The kid decides to make himself known to Bell, and the two converse for a moment, Bell lending the kid a cigarette, and him explaining his motivations. It just makes things more painful when Bell decides to brandish his gun. The Professor speaks with Lilith, and brings up a far more compelling argument as to not invade Tidalay. The wishing machine is the last thing they have. Thus, if she tried to take it by force while disregarding the rules, they would destroy it before they got into the wrong hands. The Professor gives an alternative proposal. If they were to compete in a game of wits, like a game of chess, then they would have a chance to knock each other out without breaking any of the rules. Lilith agrees to this arrangement, and while stating an opinion that is based and correct, she suggests a way to make the game more interesting. To use her magic to create giant chess pieces, and have the three of them enact the roles of important pieces. The game proceeds, the professor having a great deal of cunning in this game, but Lilith, despite her age, is able to keep up, and ultimately ends up in a checkmate situation against the professor. However, taking this much time on the game was all part of his plan, as Annie arrives and attacks Lilith from behind. Eric is bewildered by Mizuno's attack, but quickly gets back on his feet and re-enters the mech. 
He slams the mech's fist into the fish boy, and as he worries that he took things too far, Mizuno slices the arm off with a thin stream of water. As Eric gets upset that the arm's Yunam constructed is damaged, Mizuno realizes that the entire machine is powered by steam, so as Eric tries to counterattack, the machine freezes. Mizuno has caused the steam within the robot to turn back into water, and furthermore starts to flood the cockpit. As Eric starts drowning, the voice tells him to keep flooding it until he is dead citing disregard for the lives of his opponents as the reason Carl won, and that he must be willing to do the same in order to achieve their goals. Mizuno objects to this, not wanting to be the monster that he lost to. But suddenly... Carl and Relic fall into an underground railway, where the both of them can see in the dark. Carl knows how the two of them are on equal footing power-wise. This is especially true because, as an inorganic being, there would be no effect to kissing Carl. Carl questions how Relic could not hate Del for how much she dehumanized him. Or the rest of the world, for that matter. I don't hate anyone. Hatred is pointless. and doesn't solve anything. Absolutely! Hate is not the solution. It's the means. It's what brought us here in the first place. Come on, admit. You're just here because you hate me. Because I try to kill you and your little friend. You're right. I hated you for what you did. But now, though, I pity you. I pity you for your despair. Look here. You can try to use hate to give your empty life a sense. But that will destroy you from within. You don't... Too bad for you Carl fights Relic into a train station, where he finds a barrel of gas and lights the whole area of flame, fire being among the vampire's only weaknesses. Joshua brandishes his gun against the Jimbly Sweep, demanding that he'd be taken to the city limits so that he can be safely disqualified. The kid, not ready to give up just yet, creates a cloud of obscuring soot to escape. As Bell tries to locate the kid, he hears the sound of something scuttling through the overhead pipes and threatens to shoot. With so much he's fighting for on the line and himself induced into a panic, he fires wildly, hitting the pipe. There is a scream from it and then a silence. Blood starts dripping from the hole he made. He stares at what he's done and the weight of what happens suffocates him. He grows sick as vision of the kid starts dancing everywhere. The reality of the situation drowns him as he demands to take the action he took back. Carl continues to battle Relic, but his energy reserves strain, staying the fight growing harder. However, Dell enters the scene, causing Relic to be distracted long enough to get a hit in. Carl warns the vampire that humans like Dell will betray him eventually, and that they'll only be on good terms for so long as he is useful to her. To Carl, only by being the antithesis of humanity is freedom. He then decides to throw an entire steam engine on Relic, narrowly avoiding Dell in the carnage. Even he admits that this act was overkill, especially during his energy crisis. However, Relic emerges from the rebel as a bat, barely worse for wear. Carl admits that this is the end of the road for him as Relic approaches. But before Relic could get the chance to incapacitate him, yet another earthquake hits. And with the structural damage to the subway, it completely collapses. Carl looks out and is only buried slightly, while Relic remains under the rubble. And with the sun now beaming in the sky, Relic's opportunity to finish this fight had ended. Upon the attack on Lilith, her army of dolls immediately counter-assault. She also tries to weave spells against them, but Annie's attack broke the skullcap, limiting her magic potential. Facing the stuffed horde, Annie demands an explanation for what the professor caused now, but is interrupted by Lilith climbing on him and attacking him with her bare fists. Lucia tries to determine an escape route for the group, but then the clockwork bunny arrives, huge and intimidating, prompting Murphy to take care of it himself. He flings it into the distance, but when he tries to approach it to ask it to cease, it grabs Murphy and bites his leg off. While fighting the horde of dead given plush and the angry teenager who resurrected them, 
Annie decides now is the best time to tell him. She asks him if he loves her, and despite the recommendations to postpone a conversation like this, she insists on an answer, which he finally tells her yes, he loves her. It is then that she tells him that she's pregnant. Well, I suppose felicitations are in order. Mizuno hangs on the ledge of the big hole created by the earthquake, the edge breaking and preventing him from getting up. Just as he is about to fall in, Eric comes up and grabs his hand. He had escaped the cockpit earlier when the stone debris pierced it and drained the water out. As the two of them catch their breath, Eric realizes that the mech has taken some serious damage during its test drive. Mizuno demands to know why Eric would save him despite all the harm he's caused. And Eric admits that it's just not in his nature to allow that to happen to him. The answer takes Mizuno aback, but he then threatens to keep fighting despite him saving his life, to which Eric shoves him. It just so happens that they were near Tidalay's border. Mizuno had lost again. As the voice accurses the sea kid, Eric offers sandwiches to him once again. Murphy and the Clockwork Bunny were in heated battle. When Lucia and the fishbot came to take Murphy away, the bunny bit his other leg as he flew off, but Murphy set a powerful explosive in that leg, damaging it conclusively. Ginger is in disbelief of Annie's news, which she crassly restates. In light of this news, Ginger decides to hasten his own plans he had for after the tournament's end. Alanta Esperanza Marietta, I want you to do me the honor of marrying me. Immediately. The two tell each other everything they were keeping from each other. Ginger getting the ring during the heist, and her coughing up blood caused by her biting her cheek while taking a hit. They make out. Then Lucia wheelbarrows Murphy to them. They figure that Murphy's leg could be easily repaired with all the parts in the junkyard. Lucia also mentions that they and Murphy are still opponents, to which the professor finds his off switch, which is technically a defeat. The professor then requests the two of them to be witnesses for their wedding while Annie forces them to. They leave on the fish spot, intending to tell the officials about Lilith's condition. However, then the Skullcat begins to seriously malfunction. Without Lilith conscious to control it, it switches to autopilot mode and resurrects the military automatons once more. As Joshua Bell grieves for the loss of the child he shot, all of a sudden in front of him he appears with a bleeding foot, much to the kid's irritation and Belle's relief. The kid no longer wishes to play around, and gives Belle the choice of ending things the easy way or the hard way. Belle answers the easy way, so the chimbley sweep hits him over the head, knocking him out. This is not the correct account of how the chimbley sweep versus Joshua Bell match went down. There are numerous records that transcribe match events with radically different outcomes. All of these pairs of records massively conflict with each other, but this pair is the only one that comes to a consensus on who is the victor. Thus, it's not impossible that there's truth to both accounts. Regardless, this is the stated official events of the Chimbley Sweep vs. Joshua Bell match. Chimbley Sweep had vacated to his secret hideaway for supplies, but when he got there, the spot was a wreck. Someone has taken his food, his money, and his brick collection and he was still in the premises. The two point their weapons at each other, and Joshua Bell introduces himself as the hooker from hell and the most pathetic character in the tournament. He had found the money and decides to declare finders keepers. The kid tries to use their mutual backstory of living on the streets as a way to bond and make friends, to which he responds by shooting him, wildly missing. As they give chase, Bell tries to make the case that his life is worse, like being bullied in school, parents not loving him, turning to prostitution for money, and contracting AIDS. The last one Chimbley is confused by, and I will not be recapping the page where he tries to explain it. Chimbley then lays out how his life is worse, having no parents or education, and he's not complaining about his situation because how long he's lived, and that's enough for him. The two decide to finish things in a swipe off, Bell obtaining the Sweep's hat and Sweep grabbing Bell's belt, causing his leg wear to fall. Nearby Freemason guards notice Bell's lack of undergarments, mistake this for mooning them, and fires a bolt at him while his back is turned. While recovering from his wound, the Chimbley Sweep is able to nab back his hat, Bell's pants, and his wallet. The Chimbley Sweep runs off, leaving his mark as Joshua Bell roars profanities at him.
determined robots descend into the collapsed train station where Carl sits, and along with them is the inventor's nephew. He informs Carl that Relic had forfeit on his way out of the city with Dell. More importantly, he had been doing analysis of Carl for some time. The mystic energy that animates him has the ability to absorb other energies to keep Carl alive. He notes that Carl has become a greater vessel for the Law of Talos than any machine made for that purpose. He therefore gives Carl an offer, extra energy to fight with, in exchange for allowing them to more closely examine him. Annie, the Professor, Lucia and Murphy get settled in tournament official care, as Ginger worries for his fiancé's health. Annie worries that she is forcing Ginger into this position due to her pregnancy, to which he confirms that he was set on her ever since the first time she pistol whipped him. Even Murphy questions this dynamic. He also reveals that his intended wish was to clear their criminal records, but now wishes to leave as soon as their marriage is completed. Annie argues that they should stay, as raising a child while being wanted criminals would be exceedingly difficult, which Ginger reluctantly agrees. He does beg her to stay out of the action, which Annie tentatively agrees. The inventor and the nephew converse about Thaddeus' pockets, with the nephew developing a theory about him and how he was able to create watches that always kept time. He thinks that somehow, he had learned the secrets of the Law of Talos for himself. Meanwhile, Eric had to reveal to Jinam that the mech they made together had been destroyed, but then revealed that he had befriended someone who was willing to help repair it, and also had a spare boiler. The three of them start their new project, but not before having a lunch break together. A long time ago, a red-headed woman was practicing her violin on an empty stage, with the only witness to it, Carl. A crewmate of his informs him that the captain is calling a meeting tonight, but Carl is too entranced by the human, by the music, to care. As he watches, he listens. He starts to wonder. Back in the present, Carl rejects the nephew's offer, unwilling to cooperate with humans. He further questions the nephew's decision to host the tournament, seeing how much destruction was caused, especially by Carl. He admits that it was his uncle's decision, which he respects wholly. Carl requests time to think the offer over, which the nephew warns not to take the upcoming competition lightly. Carl performs a practical joke on him before he leaves, seeing to his uncle who's taken a closer look at the competition. The inventor decides to bring Eli to his laboratory to talk, wishing to speak with him again after five years. Eli asks Mulciver about his wife, to which he reveals that she, his sister, and his brother-in-law were killed in a railway accident with their son living with him now. He wanted Eli with him as he wanted to clear a misconception he must have had about the tournament. The wishing machine cannot bring the dead back to life. He knows this, as that was the first thing he attempted to wish for. Freemason guards had discovered Joshua Bell unconscious in the gutter. Whether he had his pants on or not when he was discovered is undocumented but nevertheless he was brought back to the hospital and declared disqualified. Miss Crowley tries to offer him care when he discovers that Nico is also present. The two argue about where the other has been. Nico and his friend Hunter were caught cheating in a casino and its owner, Tyrone Fossil, forced them into competing in a Coliseum tournament, making it to round three before they were defeated by a raucous pair of space mercenaries. The two of them were still upset at each other for leaving one another, but... The two of them decide to leave as soon as they can, giving a fond farewell to Miss Crowley on the way out. When they get home, Joshua sets up pictures of various tournaments the two of them have been involved in, including an island-based tournament where Nico first met Hunter, and the Coliseum and Tidely tournaments. He hung these up to remind them not to go on these adventures ever again, to which there is no record suggesting they did. They have each other now, and that is the most important thing of all. As Annie gets her dress fitted, Ginger overhears her telling a story to the dresser about her first boyfriend. She had a false pregnancy scare with him, and the boyfriend ran immediately. This is why she was afraid of giving him the news. But him deciding to jump into marriage gave her all the assurance she needs that he will not run. Eventually, she emerges with her dress unveiled and a gun strap over her waist. The dresser allows her to keep the dress for free, and the two immediately set off for a priest to wed them. The professor grabs his hat, and the two of them step forward into the future, together, on the outskirts of the Castle of Nations Park, 
A stuffed mannequin dressed as a mountain climber listens to an iPod, a gift from the person he admires the most. Jack then arrives, the two of them happy to see each other again. The climber asks if he needs something from him, to which Jack responds that he does. In a confessional booth, the priest inside gets a long confession from a new penitent. He confesses to being a liar, to being a thief, to holding people at gunpoint, conspiracy to commit crime, shooting people dead, and getting a woman who's not his wife pregnant, only the last of which concerns him. Annie gets bored of this charade and pulls the priest from the confessional, much to Ginger's annoyance. She tells him frankly that they need someone to marry them immediately, which he cautiously accepts. They could have just asked to do this. Carl emerges from the train station rubble and wonders to Arma about an old rumor he heard back at the amusement park. A fellow member of the Pirate Island claimed that once an inhabitant entered the outside world and returned out of their mind. The pirate speculated that there is something wrong with the outside world. Carl disbelieved it then, but experiencing what he has so far has given him second thoughts. He is distracted by clattering pipe vents, rattling to a waltz beat, which reminds him of violin practice. He is distracted enough to not notice when a leg kicks the disembodied yet conscious head of Spoiler. The robot introduces himself and tells Carl of the young chimbley sweeper who caught him by surprise and reduced him to the state he's in. Carl notes that this child must have been overly smart or aware of something else that gave him the upper hand, which Spoiler agrees. Carl discards the head and resolves to find the boy for further information. It's then that Arma notices the graffiti symbols on the wall, one that Carl has seen before around town. Meanwhile, Steffi and crew are busy constructing a new mech to counter Carl, trying to determine the best build for countering him as they work off the base. While arguing about specifics, Steffi notices a presence coming from around the corner and immediately tackles it. It turns out to be the Chimbley Sweep, none too pleased to be attacked out of nowhere. Again, Steffi backs off, and the kid confirms that he is a current competitor, and despite how much he dislikes them in concept, he has to compete, as only he can save his only home. While talking, Carl manages to catch up, watching from a flat. He knows that he doesn't have the energy to fight them all at once, so he hatches a plan. Elsewhere, Eric, Jinam, and Mizuno are making their way through the city, now as a unit. Jam asks Eric what his wish is, and he is unsure. He considers using it for his company, but also considers his dying grandfather. Him owning a company is news to her, to which Eric tells them all about how he pivoted his family company into one that manufactures military tech, boasting that he's responsible for turning the tides of the resource war. This revelation horrifies Jinam as it was that kind of technology that got her boyfriend killed. He claims that he's trying to help people, and that he ended the war. But Jam is not having it, not wanting to talk to him right now. Eric is despondent by this conversation, wishing for his mother's guidance, while trying to reassure himself that he did the right thing. Suddenly, the necromatic automatons march in, and along with them a cascade of residual magic. They are quickly engulfed. The young sweep asks the mech pilots if they have any food, as a man with AIDS took most of his resources. Francis offers to run to the hospital for such supplies. The Titanian native expresses surprise that others are willing to help him out, especially as they'll be heading towards the source of the tournament's chaos. Steffi asks why he hates tournaments, as she thinks they are fun. Chimbley notes that both tournaments he's been in so far he was dragged into, and that if they'd seen the things he had, they wouldn't find it as fun. During this exposition, Steffi notices Arma on the lamppost. She tells the two that she forgot to tell her employee of something she needs and is rushing to tell her quickly. Ben advises against splitting up again, to which Steffi insists that she'll be back too quickly to matter, to which Benzine calls her childish over. In actuality, with Benzine still injured and the Sweeper seemingly a non-combatant, she doesn't want others to get hurt for her own battles. She follows Arma into an apartment, where Carl slips out and locks the door behind him. Steffi is embarrassed to be fooled by such an easy trick, but she is able to use her steam-powered leg to bust through the door before it breaks. In the chapel of Saint Jen of the Arches, 
the wedding ceremony of Annie and Ginger begins. At the same time, a particular magic spirit begins to engulf Eric in his mech, and he pushes Jam and Mizuno to safety. The entity fully possesses him, and immediately decides to head for St. Jen's church, the being having a grudge with her when she was alive. Kicking down the door just as the minister asks for anyone who objects to the wedding, the spirit possessing the mech introduces himself as Rashef, the demon who killed Jen just as she killed him, and promises bloodshed as far as the eye can see. He continues to threaten the bride and groom, especially to Annie's unborn child. This act enrages her, and she decides to immediately go on the offense. Even to Rashef's surprise, Ginger is helpless to watch as his bride goes feral. Benzine hears Steffi crashing the door from the outside, and realizes that leaving a kid alone in a city overrun by a tournament is a bad idea. So he leaves Chimbley alone in the city overrun by a tournament figuring that the unarmed, powerless assistant will be back shortly. A few miles off of Tidale, high in the sky, Jack and the stone dragon he has as his beck and call make their way to the city, with Clamor along for the ride. They discuss their mission of returning Carl back to the park, and how he may fight them as he hates them so much, to which Jack clarifies that he simply hates everyone. The Clamor asks why people hate. It's not so easy. There are feelings that the more you try to resist or struggle, the stronger it gets. And as the time passes, you realize it's all you have. You've lost everything but the feeling, and then you have no choice but rely on it. Jack catches himself out of a reflective ramble and clarifies that it's for this exact reason that they have to help him, is that in this moment, he is unable to help himself. Lucia recognizes the teen in the cockpit and states that they must not kill him. Ginger is skeptical, but the pastor agrees, stating that his spirit is powerful, but that's all there is to him. In either case, Ginger is unable to assist as Annie is moving so fast in her enraged state that firing at the machine would be just as likely to hit her. He doesn't like that there's nothing he can do, but it's all up to Annie now. He does state that it's safe enough to spectate the fight, so long as Annie doesn't start speaking Spanish. Indeed, despite the demon's mech size advantage, she is nimble enough to pull vault onto the flying pews and strike the cockpit. Mizuno and Jinam enter, jam concerned about her mech, I mean Eric, Mizuno jumps in and freezes the steam engine again, giving Annie the chance to strike. However, Murphy halts the attack, worried that she's going to strike Eric dead. Annie's confused about what he's talking about, but before that's resolved, another earthquake hits. The earth quakes less powerfully at Chimbley's corner of the city. He realizes that there's no point in staying there and being a sitting duck, but it is at that exact moment that Carl approaches him. He asks the kid if he's seen the trio he was just talking to, but the boy is suspicious of him immediately. He asks him what's wrong with his eye, to which he responds that he fell down some stairs. He conjoles Chimbley into admitting that they were there before they ran off, and that they were supposed to be temporary allies. He is more receptive when Carl asks for the location of the old inventor, sharing his home address, with knowledge of where to find the inventor and ask about the law of Talos. He thanks the kid asking if there's anything he can do in return. Perhaps. Got a penny in your pocket? Oh, let me see. Ah, here. You can have it. Ah! Narrowly missing his attack, Carl notes that there isn't a single normal child in this city. Chimbley gets a getaway while Carl pursues, begging him to stop running like a coward. Chimbley notes that the pink hair girl lost because she didn't run, much to Carl's amusement. Rashef gets a chance to retaliate, and swings Annie around by the bale and launches her to the chandeliers, ironically out of his reach. Jam informs Annie that the being is not Eric, and she begins to literally shout from the rafters that this ancient demon that's intent on slaughtering all is not Eric. Jam clarifies what she actually means, but Annie is unsympathetic to the prospect of saving Eric's life. Mizuno is unable to help either, as he doesn't think he can gain control of the mech's steam supply again due to the demon's influence. They just have to watch on, as Jam worries that her past is going to repeat itself. 
the Titanian youth runs across a steel beam to an adjacent building, and as Carl tries to follow, his acrophobia kicks in and forces him to a standstill. The kid taunts the psychopath chasing him and makes his getaway downstairs. Carl slowly inches his way through the building, eventually reaching safety. He then bursts through the floors of the building, cutting off the kid's escape. Before he can act, Freemason grunts fire against Carl, as he's caused damage to a competitor's safe building. When they try to force Carl to comply, he slaughters them. Shimley gets away in the scuffle out of the building and into a junkyard, where he encounters a chain-link fence, and Carl corners him. I think we had enough of the whole cat and mouse chase. Annie formulates a plan. As the demon tries to strike her down, she intercepts him and pins him to the floor. She requests the priest's rosary, and for Mizuno to splash down holy water at the right time. She then starts chanting a prayer, in Spanish. In the name of the joyful mysteries, I pray. Dios te salve, Maria. Llenes eres de gracia. El Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres. Y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre. Jesús, Santa Maria, Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros pecadores, ahora y en la hora de nuestra muerte. Amen. And there's the Spanish. Good Lord. Mizuno slashes the water onto him, and as he starts cursing her, he is excised out of the teen's body. Ginger checks to make sure she is alright. Jinan breathes a sigh of relief until Annie pulls a gun against him. She is not taking the chance that the demon could still be within him, and given he threatened everything she loved, she feels no need for mercy, despite Jan's protests. She demands one good reason why she shouldn't kill him. What? Who? Who's talking? Can't understand. Sounds like... Mom? Chimbley asks for his motivations, and Carl claims that a thief killed his parents. He naturally thinks that explanation is ludicrous, but he doesn't question it, presumably because he's seen crazier. He insists that he shouldn't die here, as he's encountered so much grief and insanity that this would be no way to go out. He tells of how he survived through orphanages, academies, the streets, and especially an asylum where he was forced to fight in a tournament against such forces as the demon responsible for creating the Minotaur, the immortal escapee of an island cult, Nurse Crowley, a samurai mechanic, and a sentient mannequin dressed as a mountain climber, the last one in particular knocking him out of the tournament. But not after a parasitic symbiote attached to him and nearly drowning from the facility flooding. And even after that, getting caught up in a fight between competitors and a flood of insane children associated with fairy tales, then rushing for the exit, and barely escaping, the entire facility utterly annihilated from the clashing forces from within. And now the sight mish mash decided to wreck our city! The only one gone! So that's why you don't want to die here? That's alright. I understand. What? Go die in New Jersey! Now mostly recovered from the events of last night, he decides that he too can't die here. He declares out loud to the Castle of Nations that despite his waning energy, he will get his wish, and then Carl will come for him. Once Eric was safely recovered, the wedding was able to proceed. The priest asks if these two roughneck, wily, conniving, determined, dedicated criminals if they would take each other to be their partner till death do them part, which they both agree. They are pronounced husband and wife. They walk out of the church, wondering what they're gonna do about the undead robots. However, as they go out, they see a sight that is unbelievable. Steffi and Benzine return to the mech, Ben having repaired her leg. They don't see the boy there, and Steffi assumes that Carl must have gotten to him. She rushes onward, but then the two of them notice the Zeppelin flying overhead. Inside are the Freemasons and their leader, Clarence. They received word that Carl has killed two of their member and are retaliating. Also overhead of the city is Jack and Clymer, as Jack gets accumulated to the city's unusual energy, which Clymer cannot sense. It is then that Jack notices that something unusual is protruding out of the city. The nephew continues to observe the phenomena surrounding the tournament, 
the uncle was in the same observatory. He insists that he hears something, despite the nephew unable to hear anything out of the ordinary, aside from more steam from the city being released. The uncle is enraptured by what he's witnessing, insisting that the city is alive. The nephew takes that figuratively, insisting that the city has been alive for some capacity this whole time, but the uncle, in a state of euphoria, insists to look closer. It is then the nephew notices. The latest earthquake has caused part of the streets to dislodge itself from the rest. Clutters of steam vents protrude out, much in a way that resembles fingers. The nephew asks the uncle if this is going to continue, which the uncle responds, I hope so, my boy. This, this is how tight lace should be. The nephew witnesses this event and realizes the glass on the observation deck needs to be reinforced. As Clymer and Jack witness the rising city, Clymer notices something else. An old friend, flying hundreds of feet in the air, unconscious. He catches him in the air, and fortunately falls onto some high buildings, breaking the boy's fall with his soft body. He tells Jack that how they know each other is a long story, which they don't have time for. In an observation deck, the nephew is witnessing the event alongside a few others, like Jumper. She is an orphan teen with size-changing powers and shoes of her own invention that create platforms. Despite not being part of the tournament, she hung around the city and got into trouble in a few areas, like Carl chasing her because he thought she had some new info on the Law of Talos, or she and Clymer getting a foul of the Clerk Street Orphan Prison, all the while reconciling with her previous need for her parents to be proud of her. Also in the observatory is the couple Ethan and May. Their records are lost. The nephew looks on at the monstrosity rising from the city and wonders, what if, alongside everyone else, the city itself had a wish? As the procession of the unconscious Lilith proceeds, Reshef joins them by possessing a guardian statue and bringing it to life. The tournament enforcers are useless to hold them back, and when they force debris to fall onto her head, the skullcap concentrates its magic onto her further. Elsewhere, the inventor Mulciber is showing off the wish machine to Eli, realizing that he appropriated Labriola's machine that he tried to use to cheat death. The inventor notes that it's largely ironic that a machine designed to cheat death ultimately became one for granting wishes, despite their only wish was to cheat death. Carl stands triumphant in the junkyard when he notices Rachel standing behind him. He tries to serenade her with romantic words, but she finds it hard to get into the mood when he's covered in blood. She is surprised that he isn't interested in attacking her again. Carl reveals he knows the truth. She is not Rachel. Using Carl's memories as a basis, she is a manifestation of the Law of Talos itself. They reveal that they had come to him now, after hiding from him for so long, because they plan a big event for the day, and they want him to be a part of it. Their wish is the same as his. They want to be free, free of the humanity that exploits them. Carl refuses his power, however, noting that all sentient power sources are the same. He doesn't want to be a puppet for someone else, human or otherwise. The Law of Talos tells him that he only has a few hours of energy left, and leaves. Carl curses his need for energy when the Freemason blimp arrives. Mulciber changes the subject to the Colossus outside. He explains that his great-uncle Asterius, despite the madness he experienced at the end of his life, was a mastercraft at his work. When asked why Asterius would create such a thing, he explains that he lost his fiance, Jen, to a demon that attacked the city. He created the Titan so that, in Titanite's finest hour, they would have the trump card to save them all. Jack and Clymer look over the unconscious chimbley sweep. Jack says they need to bring him to city authorities, but before they can act on it, the necromatic robot army appears over the horizon. Sweep wakes up to the sight of Clymer staring down the army. He panics, worried that he somehow ended up in the asylum, and exclaims extreme disapproval of the situation. The marriage group witnesses the title a titan. Annie names the robot Pointy, Lucia and Murphy treat the machine as Murphy's dad, and Eric, Mizuno, and Jinam are figuring out how to take control of it. Annie admits to Ginger that she's scared. He asks her if she wants to forfeit now, which even now she doesn't. As Ginger suggests taking shelter at the tournament headquarters, 
She realizes that the wish machine must be there, and now's the time to nab it while everyone's priorities are elsewhere. We ain't no goddamn heroes, we're bank robbers. I say we do what we do best, take the wish and get the ever-loving hell out of ye old Liberty City before we're giant robot roadkill. This isn't our city, this isn't our home, and it's time we finish this. As the two rogues make their final plan, they are all being watched by a stone raven. Sometimes, things don't end up like you expect. Hello! Hmm, I don't remember seeing you before. We haven't met before indeed. Hello, Castle of Nations. You're from Pirate Island, aren't you? Well, well, Mr. Pirate... Oh, no, 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 don't, don't presume things like that. I'm no pirate. My name is Carl. Pleased to meet you. Carl? Carl? Huh, huh, made, made in, Germany? in Germany? Just, just kidding, just, just kidding. Just kidding. So, so, why are, why are you, you here, here under, under this, this rain, rain, Carl? Oh, I just wanted to have a nice chit-chat. You see, a thought came to me on my way here. I was just wondering what kind of deal you have with humans. Deal? Oh, you know. What makes you stand here motionless and left them wandering freely doing whatever they want? Now, no, why, why wouldn't I? Don't you think that's a little unfair? We have to stay still while watching them walk around and leave and then come back and then leaving again. I, I don't, don't know, know if I get, get your, your point. point. The point is, why can't we do the same? Carl, Carl you know, know we can't live among humans. humans. They'll, They'll never, tolerate never tolerate us. It's part, part of, of their nature. nature. What, what would you want me to do? I don't know. Kill them all? <laughs> uh, that would be a bit too drastic. As much as it needs to be. <laughs> Is that blood inside your broken arm? Oh? Oh, dearie me, and I thought the rain had already done its job. Good eyes. Or windows, for that matter. Oh. What have you done? Annie, Ginger, and all their associates make their way to the tournament headquarters. Andy discusses the possibility of getting a house. Ginger asks how they could pay for it if they're going clean, and Annie suggests him getting a job. They talk about how they'd handle a household of children, and she's surprised by the use of the word children, plural. She suggests seeing how the first one turns out before considering more and the two agreed that getting a house would be good in any case. Get down! <laughs> Fuck. As Ginger tends to an injured Annie, Carl addresses the crowd of friends, proclaiming that he has just saved the city. Arma had overheard the pair's plan to make the wish for themselves and flee, and Carl taunts the group for believing them to be genuine. Annie, stay still. You know how to show a girl a good time, Ginger. Don't talk, we'll get help. Just <sighs> stay with me. Well, hell, looks like this is the real deal. <coughs> stay with me, dammit. Murphy doesn't understand, so Carl spells out their plan for them. Genom rejects Carl's claim then remembers Annie nearly killing Eric. Annie, no, stay with me. Sorry, Ginger. No, no! I tried. Carl proclaims again that he had saved the city and tries to get the professor to admit it. The professor yells at him for shooting a pregnant woman. Carl corrects his vernacular usage to which the professor shoots him to pieces. The professor takes Annie's body away. Eric demands an explanation, to which the professor threatens to kill him for getting in his way. Genom also asks if what Carl said is true, with Eric ignoring his dismissal of the issue. He screams at them that it doesn't matter anymore. There is only one thing that can fix this now. The wish. Despite the pair's plot, Genom and the rest decide to join him to save her life. They all move on, as Carl starts to reassemble himself. 
They barge into the laboratory and demand the old inventor, Angus Mulciver, to use the wish machine to bring Annie to life, which he has to explain to them that it cannot do that. However, as they argue, Eli notices a converter that was part of his original machine and how it's intact despite the machine's use so far. He remembers the words engraved onto the memorial of Asterius, Mortui vivos dosen. He comes to a revelation. He believes that the law of Talos is causing machines to function even if they shouldn't. He thinks that, with parts from Antonius, he can modify the wishing machine so it's more similar to his original immortality machine, which will function within the city. Angus rejects their proposal, as they may destroy the machine in their attempt to modify it, and furthermore, the karma of messing in the domain of gods may rack against them further for trying. He had seen the path Asterius once tread, and refuses to follow. Eli rejects this, admonishing him for letting a woman die under his care, and simply stating that, just for once, he would like to save a life with his machines for a change. The professor states that Antonius's body, which contains parts they need, is in their hotel room, so Lucia and Murphy head off to retrieve it in the fish pot. The nephew, Jordan, informs the group that Lilith is getting closer, and the giant robot isn't moving to stop her. Her necromancy may also interfere with the machine intending to bring the dead back to life properly. On top of everything else, Carl is seen intact outside of the observatory. Jam decides to assist Eli. Eric decides to pilot the robot Colossus himself. And the professor decides to finish things off with Carl personally, with Mizuno tagging along. Each person goes to their respective stations. Eric reaches the control panel of the Titan Lake Titan and learns how to control it, much to his enjoyment of controlling a robot this big. Mizuno and the Professor chase Carl down to a mining facility where he's playing elusive. The Professor fires through the ceiling, unintentionally starting a fire due to how much acetone is coated all over. The Professor asks Carl if his declaration of saving the city was a pretense, hoping to get him talking so that he can follow his sound though Carl is circling above him, so tracking him would be difficult. Carl says his main motivation was to kill humans, as he hates them so, and killing a pregnant woman means less humans to be around. Carl flings Arma as a knife into the professor's shoulder. Carl hates humans, as he believes that they are murderous, dishonest, pious kind. Carl may be the same, but he knows what he is, and he has no pretension of pretending that that's not his nature. The professor points out that his earlier proclamations of saving the city against him and Annie contradict his philosophy, but Carl disagrees. And how long do you suppose they'll honor that? As long as the city doesn't need a Hail Mary? Until those who watch from their ivory towers begin to get antsy? How long until they turn on one another? It's there. It's in you. It's in all of you. Push enough, just enough, and you break. What did you do? Answer me! Eric is attempting to fight back the robot horde, but he is struggling. In the conflict, the hotel begins to collapse while Lucia and Murphy are still inside. Murphy manages to hold the roof up, telling Lucia to escape. She manages to get out of the way, but the integrity of Murphy's arms fail, and he is crushed. On a nearby rooftop, Jack, the Climber, and Chimbley Sweep watch in amazement and terror. Climber decides that saving this city is a higher precedent than finding Carl, despite Jack's objections. He leaps into action, when the boy possibly named Nigel clings on, demanding to be taken to the Colossus. Who the hell are- Start Wastewin! From what I've seen, things are picked on because you don't know loaf of core about what you're about. I literally have no idea what you just said. Here's a translation then, Gov. You don't know Taitelli, you don't know what you're doing, and that's where I come in. Get up. Climber stares down the robot horde, unsure where to start. Steffi comes along as cavalry, and with her she brings the doll forms of Denbei and Yi Quan, who explains that Lilith is being controlled by the Skullcap, and if they can remove it, the horde will desist. Perhaps. This is what happened to Greg and Renfield. The professor examines Mizuno's body and realizes that his wound isn't deep. Carl doesn't want to be traced with a trail of blood, 
but also Mizuno is weak enough that, if he leaves, he will be picked off for sure. Carl tries again to sneak attack, but is caught by the professor and forced back into the shadows. He rejects Carl's logic about the city, pointing out that the city is alive because of its people, and it's dying now because the people were leaving. Carl points out that the law of Talos is within the city and now humans are unnecessary to keep it alive. He states that something similar happened to his park. Eli and Jam continue to work on the machine, asking how things are going with the heroes outside. Jordan tells him that things are going well enough, but he's concerned about the conspicuous absence of the Porcelain Man, as his ability to attract and absorb energies, including that of necrotic magics, could be a source of big trouble. Outside, the heroes fight on, Jimbley directing Eric on strategic points to force the Horde into, Denbei, Yiquan, and Steffi blasting the Horde away, and Clymer jumping and fighting his way through, making his way to Lilith, using everything he has against them, including the dark power he obtained in the Asylum. After much struggle, he makes it through the Skullcap's defenses, and destroys it off her head. And immediately all the souls animating the dead mechanical Horde leave their bodies, and flow straight into the mining facility. They surge into Carl, and the energy overwhelms him. The souls of when they were living invade his mind, and he completely loses his composure as he's being overrun by humanity. Eli asks Jordan what it would take to defeat Carl, and he says that they would need something worse. No, 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 I see their lives. I am them. My brother's been sent to war. My best friend lied. I have cancer and I'm gonna... They hit me dead. They hurt me. I the music. I I'll never see her again. Go. I, I don't can't want this. My brother's dying. I have cancer my, and I'm gonna... My, my best friend lied. They hit me war. Dead. They hurt me. I don't want this. I don't want this. I couldn't stop. see her again. I can't hear anything anymore. I... Music. Uh, I... I killed your wife. I killed your wife. The issue in your argument is I, that you do not understand people. I killed your wife. I suppose a doll can't. I well, you might be getting wife. a better idea now. I killed your wife. Yes, you did. I killed your wife. And you see, you don't care who dies, but others do. And you're right. People do hide what they're capable of. They will change if you push them far enough. I killed your wife. But it's not a matter of time. It's a matter of choice. People are needy, you I see. Killed your wife. They are weak. They are tragedy. I killed your wife. And they are fools. They are what we call I killed your wife. emotionally fragile. I killed your wife. But they don't break like dolls or toys. Don't snap neatly in two. I killed your wife. They shatter. Mizuno was able to save the professor with a water bubble, and they are both able to leave the burning factory. Mizuno desires to watch the place burn, so the professor leaves them to it. All of the contestants had gathered in the tournament headquarters, including a now conscious Lilith. She was last seen talking with the chimbley sweep, presumably so he could tell her to rethink her life. Ginger watches over the body of Annie. When Lucia arrives and drops the gear off, she demands that he phrase his wish correctly. He asks what happened to Murphy, and she tells him not to screw this up. Time passes, and the machine is complete. The professor, as is his right for defeating the final contestant, makes a wish upon the machine. He wishes that everyone who was slain in this tournament to be resurrected. Eli warns that this may overload the system, but it's too late. The magic rifts over tidally, and it is granted. As day breaks, a vampire awakens, surprised to feel the sun's warmth. A robot awakens to find that he is now constructed of flesh, and a porcelain statue finds that he has become the thing he hates the most. He starts swearing to kill the man who caused it, but Mizuno grabs his arm and reminds him that he is now 60% water, as all humans are. 
The climber finds him, and after swearing he won't forget the fact the fish boy gave him, he is finally taken home. Ginger? What? Are you okay? Where are we? What do you remember? We were gonna get a house. And then there was that guy and I... You were gone. How did you... The wish. Sorry, Ginger. I really cocked it up, huh? No, no. We'll... We'll be fine. The hell am I saying? It took you two hours to bring me back to life. We've got eight months to clear our criminal record. Bet we can figure something out. Criminal records? Excuse me, gentlemen. My hero. Nine months pass after the tournament's end. Tidele is experiencing a boon like it never had before. The newly understood capabilities of the Law of Talos means that new technology is progressing fast, and the destruction of much of the city means new businesses and construction is booming. These and a growing population means that Tidele has become alive, just as the old man wished. In an interview with Eli, he speculates that the machine should have malfunctioned as it delivered the wish, but the Law of Talos prevented it from doing so. He speculates that, maybe, perhaps, the law had a wish of its own, to live again. Annie and Ginger's child did end up being born, though what happened to them after that is only for them to tell. Most of what happened to the other contestants and the tournament organizers is undocumented. But there are some specifics known. The magic that causes Carl to be alive is fundamentally incompatible with humanity, thus as he inhabited his human body, his essence was gradually repelled out of it. A few days, or possibly hours, after becoming a human, Carl died, this time permanently. Jack elected to inform the Titanian authorities of this, since Carl was a human, even if briefly, thus he is no longer their responsibility. At some later point, the truth about Mizuno was also discovered. He was created from a laboratory by a being from another dimension. They were the voice in Mizuno's head, and they were trying to manipulate him into freeing them from their prison. In addition, Mizuno and Eric became romantically interested in each other. What each of them are doing now is unknown. They are doing it together. Lastly, there was the other competitor theorized to be a threat to the whole city. Spoiler was presumed dead by the officials, even as his head somehow reattached itself to the body and he was discarded in the junkyard, along with Rip. Both Black Ace and Spoiler's program soon awakened after being dumped, and began fighting for control of the body. Spoiler now remembers that there's a promise he made to someone that he must keep, but despite his determination, he is unable to subdue the Black Ace protocol. Now capable of asserting control on his own, and insisting that the two are one and the same. He allows Spoiler some superficial control, as a shadowy being approaches them for an opportunity to see his full past. But the result of this encounter is the tale of a different tournament. Steampunk is an anachronistic genre. It's inspired by the earliest science fiction works of the 19th century, but while works at the time and thereafter were trying to look forward, steampunk is a look back. It is definitionally nostalgic. Its color palettes are brown and gold, like sepia tone photographs. Steam power is the defining technology, despite its potential of being long superseded by better technology. And there is a wonder that Maybe everything could be powered by clean water. The discovery of this series changed my life. Or at least, it pointed me to a direction I'm very happy I went, went in. The OCT community created in its wake, shaped my design aspirations, it gave me my friend circle, and let me practice being a good storyteller forever be indebted to unknown person for indicating that all of this was here, even if incidentally. 
But I made this because everyone involved at the time earned their due. There is a tendency to depict the steampunk era as a world of optimism and opportunity for all, when there was a lot of things that were wrong baked into its system. Prejudice, inequality, expansionism, those all existed in steampunk's golden era, but, but modern tellings tend to brush that aside. But most of all, it's a call for happier times, not current times. There is sometimes a worry that, at some point in your life, you will never experience happiness again, especially when the world seems bleak. This is rarely true in totality, but there are things that you'll never experience again. You peek into the window behind you, and you wonder not what the future will bring, but if you are alright with this belonging to the past, forever. One thing I discovered super late in the video's development is that Manic Pixie and Crochan were in a relationship in this period. I tried not to make this video about the people because I didn't want it to be about that, but I bring this up now to show that queer people were part of the OCT community from the very beginning, which probably isn't surprising from those within it, but that's not how the golden age of OCTs are ever talked about. That's why I wanted to give Joshua Bell an extra fair shake. The subject matter is probably too much for a communal art contest, but it's genuine, it's raw, it's a reminder that being queer involved more grit and tragedy before the modern era. The thing about Pixie and Crochan, though, is that both of these creators stopped using DeviantArt sometime in 2011. Didn't leave a trace of if they migrated elsewhere, and their usernames are too generic to look up. I have no way to know where they are, or even if they're still together. Not that I'm owed that information, but everything I have to know them by were their stuff from this era. For all intents and purposes, these two, or the idea of these two, are stuck in the late 2000s, together, forever. You can always make things that are inspired by the past, but it will never truly be the past. Steampunk is looking to the past to make the present more enjoyable. You can look at everything it's made, the good, the bad, the goofy, the dramatic, the intimate, the sense of community that was once there. And you can build something like it, with the things you like and without those you don't. And you can share it with your friends, and you can make new friends from it, and you can use it to build who you are, and who you will be, and who you want to be. But try as you might, you will never experience specifically that thing ever again. And that's okay.
and now's the time to nab it while everyone's priorities are elsewhere. We ain't no goddamn bank robbers. We're... We're sussy bakas. We're just sussy little bakas. Ginger, you're such a good sussy little baka for me. Oh, and you got this sussy little baka pregnant. <laughs> I'm leaving that one in. That one was terrible. When she tells him about his backstory, he remembers where he and his brother were in a car accident. And when they woke up, they were in an abandoned amusement. <laughs> they were in the best man amusement park. They were in so long. Jackass, all nations. 